Live launches, Legos, Christmas, what does these all have in common? Stand by and you'll find out. I'm Mike Siegel, I write for Ordinary Times. This is The Throughput. So it's uh, about midnight almost here and uh, I am watching live the coverage of the Artemis launch, which is planned for T minus 45 minutes. I was hoping to organize like a, a live stream of my reaction to it, but it's been, this is a very busy time of year for me, a very busy time in uh, academia in general. And so I wasn't able to organize that, but you're going to be able to see my tape delayed reaction to the launch of Artemis. Artemis, for those you don't know, is our planned mission to return to the moon. This is the biggest rocket we've built since Apollo. Uh, it has to be. You remember I've talked about the tyranny of the rocket equation. You need a big rocket if you're going to get to lunar orbit. And so this is going to be an unmanned test flight to see how well the rocket works. It's been delayed a couple times. Right now we're still on schedule. T minus 44 minutes and 30 seconds uh, to get it launched. Hopefully it goes off tonight and uh, you'll get to see my reaction a couple days later. So in celebration of this launch, uh, I thought I'd talk about something that I think is kind of cool, which is uh, which is Legos. Uh, in particular, the Lego Saturn V, which is one of the most popular models that Lego has ever come out with. I own one of them. Uh, many astronomers I know have this on the mantelpiece. As a space enthusiast, as an astronomer, as an astrophysicist, I, it's not just a cool toy. I love the attention to detail that has gone into these uh, premier kits that Lego built. You, know, you can see, for example, these engines, some of the most mighty engines ever built that applied 33,000 kilonewtons of thrust to the main rocket. You know, this corrugated section right here, you have essentially a fuel tank in here and then a liquid oxygen tank and that feeds into the engines. Well, this area here is not reinforced by those pressurized tanks. So you want it to be strong. So that's what that corrugation is all about. You also have these service tunnels that bring electronics and cables down through the first stage and also put liquid oxygen back into the top of the tank to pressurize it to keep the uh, pressure going down to keep the rocket fed. Now there is one little inaccuracy in this uh, in this first stage that is this part right here the uh, separation of the first stage when Saturn was actually launched what would happen is the first stage would fall away and you'd have this ring sort of clinging to the second stage like that you know, they wouldn't separate cleanly like this. You'd have a ring that surrounded these engines. The purpose of the interstage was to protect the engines of the second stage. It was thought that if you just dropped the first stage as one big thing, there was a possibility it would move a little bit sideways and potentially smash into the uh, engines of the second stage, which would obviously be very bad. By dropping the first stage, waiting a bit, and then dropping the interstage, you make a collision between those departing segments a little less likely and give your engines a little more protection. There were other reasons, but that was the main one. Uh, but you can see a little bit of the internal structure. Uh, it's kind of amazing how they've built these models. They're really strong. And a lot of what you do here when you're building these models is building that internal structure to give it that that solidity to it. And, uh, and then you cover it up with these curved pieces uh, to give it this nice picture. Now, the second stage, which I'll pull out here, is also very nice. It has the, again, the five engines that were used for the second stage to uh, get it up into further orbit. You also have that corrugated section here. In this stage, the two tanks of oxygen kerosene were actually pressed together and shared a bulkhead. So you didn't have that separation between them, but you still had this. This is the interstage between the second and third. So it was a little bit inaccurate that it does have you know, doesn't have this where the second stage falls away and then you have this ring uh, separating them that then falls away uh, after they after they separate it. But if you did that, the model wouldn't be very strong and it'd fall apart. So I understand completely why they did that. You also have these uh, engines that give you some separation from the interstage. And again, these, uh, these service tunnels and so forth. So again, very accurate. You can see a lot of the internal structure uh, that makes these models so strong. You then have, of course, the third stage with a single engine. Uh, this is after, once they were uh, pretty high in orbit, this is what would, would carry them off. Up here is the escape motor. This is a rocket that would presumably, in the case of an accident, pull the, serv the crew module, which is this little piece up here. That's, that's where the crew is. Uh, that would pull them off. Let's see, I think I have somewhere around here. Yeah, I have the crew members, so you can get a sense of scale of this model. Um, so this is the, uh, what would be the third stage that would launch them into orbit. And then, 
what you do. So at some point during the launch, you get rid of this rocket because once you're above a certain altitude, it's not gonna do you any good. So you get rid of that uh, abort rocket. Now you have the crew module, the service module, and its engine, and the limb. This is the lunar module. So the limb would be sitting on top of the first stage, and then of course, they would dock with it, pull it off, and then this combined structure would go to the moon. And if you've seen Apollo 13, this should look very familiar. With well, the Apollo 13 explosion was in the service module here, that they had an explosion that ripped open one part of the spacecraft. It turned out that they were that they were able to return, probably do a video on Apollo 13 at some point. And then, of course, they'd get to the moon. This lunar module would come down, land on the surface, and I don't think it'll, yeah, it'll separate. This little return vehicle would come back, rendezvous with the spacecraft in orbit. They would then return to the Earth. Then this, they would jettison the service module, and this little capsule is all that would return to the surface of the Earth out of this massive, gigantic rocket. And I'll reassemble it here just so you can get, again, that appreciation of just how enormous this thing was. And so having reassembled it, I know I'm not gonna get the whole thing in one shot, but you can see just how enormous this rocket was to deliver this little capsule to the surface of the moon and to return it. And the accuracy um, is, is, is very good. But moreover, this was just a fun build. If you're a space enthusiast, this is a, just, a, just an enormous fun. One of the things I've been getting into these Lego premiere sets that are very, that are rather pricey, but the attention to detail is impressive, but also the way they use just regular Lego pieces uh, to build these things. This only, this model only has maybe a couple of specialized pieces, most of which are just normal pieces with United States of America or whatever painted on them. And so it's, uh, it's very impressive the uh, amount of thought and engineering that has gone into this. And if you're a space enthusiast and you don't have this model and you enjoy Legos or puzzles or things like that, I, I do recommend it. It's not cheap at about $120, but it is one of their most popular models and there is a reason for that. All right, looks like we're down to 23 T minus 23 minutes. We're still on course for launch. So I'll go over the other uh, space thing that I, space Lego that I got into. This was, I bought this last year. And this is the shuttle Discovery. So the shuttle has a lot of really nice details that to the space enthusiast, it has the fully operational cargo bay complete with the arm that was used to grasp satellites or the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, accurate floodlights, has this crew compartment right here that is, uh, I mean, within the scale, reasonably scientifically accurate. Uh, you have the main engines that it used when it had the fuel tank running up into it. Then the uh, smaller engine it used to maneuver in orbit. You can deploy the landing gear. This was also just a real joy to build. They've managed to make these things so that you can build them with a good, good deal of structural integrity, but it doesn't get monotonous. And so uh, this was also a very fun build. And the Discovery model also comes with, ta-da, the Hubble Space Telescope. As someone who has worked on Hubble data, this is something that I, I really appreciate, uh, the uh, amount of detail given into something, really even especially at this scale. Uh, you have, of course, the solar panels, which provide power. You have the deployable high-gain antennas, which is how it communicates with the ground. Um, you have you know, the back end, which is where uh, the servicing missions would operate. It also has a little bit of a, of a hint of the dock they attached so that if you ever needed to deorbit the spacecraft that you could. The one thing that is inaccurate about the uh, Hubble we do not have a lens on the cut on the front of the Hubble. Most of this area of the Hubble Space Telescope is empty space. You have the primary mirror back here, it reflects up to a small secondary mirror, and then back to the instrument packages, which are down here. I understand why LEGO didn't build it that way, because it would look very strange and it would not have a lot of strength. Again, with most of these models, a lot of the, what you're doing is building that internal structure so that they are, are stable, don't fall apart the second you put them on your mantelpiece. 
But uh, other than that, uh, this is a really accurate uh, display of what the uh, actual Hubble Space Telescope looks like. I've actually brought this into class uh, to show the students so that they can can uh, look at it because it is accurate enough that they can get a sense of the scale and of Hubble and what it does. So we're down to 13 minutes. Uh, I guess you can tell how long it's taken me to do some of these takes by how fast the time's been moving. But um, uh, this is one I highly recommend. Now there was a push on last year, if you, you Google it, you can find it, to have a Lego model of the JWST. Um, the one that they designed was actually really cool where you could attach the sun shield and do all the deployment and so forth. I do hope that they eventually come out with something like that because it would be really cool. The other model that I have not gotten yet but I, I hope to get soon is the Lunar Lander. My brother uh, recently built that and was telling me about all the little finicky details they put onto the to the Lunar Lander so I'm hoping to get that one soon. But really these are great kits. Not I, I enjoy them as a Lego enthusiast, I enjoy building them, but also as an astronomer, as a scientist, as a space enthusiast, seeing the incredible amount of detail they've gone into, you know, little details like, you know, cables coming out and uh, the deployment of these and, and how the uh, you can actually set the shuttle to actually grasp it with its uh, with its arm, kind of, and so forth. This is a, a really, I, I think, really wonderful and a, a great just a great thing for someone who is enthusiastic about space. Hey, so we're in a launch delay right now. Um, I was supposed to launch at 104. We're now approaching 104 a.m. Since it's getting late and we're still holding the countdown to 10 minutes, I've gone back to my bedroom, so I'm not in my library anymore. And I'll uh, continue to update as we get closer so that uh, you can see hopefully my real-time reaction to the launch. So it's 1.35 a.m. We're looking like we're getting uh, some clearances from the uh, NASA guys. They're going down their checklists and so forth, so uh, hopefully we'll start the 10-minute uh, launch soon. To make this day possible, and for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, launch director, and thank you. We're on our, we're we do have a couple of steps to on our way to the 10-minute we'll countdown. Resume the clock. But the ALS will check, make sure there's no holds coming from the ground up until T minus two. ALS, go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The space launch system is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. Launch team can 20. no longer recycle the count. Sound suppressor water now 15. flowing under the ML. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen one, burn off igniters eight, initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And lift off of Artemis One. Wow. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. Four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Pairing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q in about one minute and nine seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmosphere and force on the rocket. I didn't expect to be this thrilled by it. I've been kind of jaded by Artemis, but there's nothing like a rocket launch, is there? So about 30 seconds from now. A 
again quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster this is jettison. Awesome. I have nothing to say. This is just awesome. SRB. Confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. All right, so uh, I'll cut it off there since uh, it's going to be a while before we have the next stages, but th that was as about as good as launch as you could ask for. And uh, I've been kind of jaded about Artemis because it, of the, the current price of it and um, questions about the mission and the overall plan for returning to the moon. But um, there is nothing more thrilling than a space launch. Uh, I've seen a space launch live. Uh, I saw the uh, Columbia launch uh, when uh, she went up to service the uh, shuttle. Uh, for one of those missions and if you've never seen it in person it is extraordinary and even just seeing it on tv is amazing so uh you're never going to get me poo-pooing a, sh uh, a successful rocket launch so hopefully uh the beginning of uh some success with the artemis mission and uh, we'll have more to say on this later uh in the meantime uh i'm mike siegel i write for ordinary times uh thank you for watching and godspeed artemis It has a fairly accurate code module. Ugh.